I would like to take this opportunity uh, at the outset to warmly welcome each one of you uh, attending this uh, very key industry conference. Uh, gratitude and special thanks to all the panelists for taking time out uh, from their busy schedule. And as we all know, we are in the midst of extremely challenging times. So uh, with prayers and best wishes for everyone's well-being, uh, let's start the second panel discussion of the first day of this two-day virtual conference on meeting emission norms. Uh, so uh, meet, meeting emission challenges. So uh, the theme of uh, this session, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, is power trains to meet future norms. And we have a very uh, interesting uh, panel uh, of uh, industry uh, experts, uh, starting with Mr. R. Verlusami, who is the chief global product development, uh, chief of global product development of uh, the automotive division at Mahindra and Mahindra. Uh, very warm welcome to you, Mr. Velusami. Hi, Sundra. How are you? Warm to have you. Uh, Mr. Gaurav Gupta, Chief Commercial Officer at MG Motor India. So, uh, a warm welcome to you, to Gaurav. And uh, Mr. Sanjeev Saxena, who is the President, Automotive Technologies at Schaeffler India. So, uh, we welcome you to this panel discussion, Mr. Saxena. And we have an international, uh, a global uh, expert uh, joining us from Paris. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Jean-Paul Roux, for uh, really starting your day early for us. Uh, so I believe it's around 8.30 or so in the morning for you. So thank you very much for uh, joining this panel discussion. Uh, Jean-Paul Roux is the uh, worldwide VP sales at Simulia of uh, Dassault uh, Systems. So thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for uh, participating in this panel discussion. And uh, when I think of, uh, as I was thinking about the, uh, the theme of this panel discussion, power trains to meet future norms, especially in the context of the, or, or rather in the backdrop of uh, the BS6 uh, emission norms, the first thing that comes to my mind is the huge shift towards uh, 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 petrol, in the, especially in the, in the passenger vehicle uh, market. And uh, when I think about that shift, which is again triggered by mainly by the BS6 emission, strict, strict BS6 emission norms, the two names come to my mind topmost. One is uh, market leader Maruti Suzuki, which has gone 100% uh, uh, petrol. And the other one, Earlier, a very strong player in the diesel segment, now making swift inroads into the petrol segment. And that is uh, Mahindra and Mahindra. We have seen uh, in the response, some of its new models like the XUV 300 and uh, uh, the TAR has got in the petrol segment. So let me start off with you, uh, Mr. Vil Sami. Uh, this transition, which is uh, kind of, it's not that m, &M was not present in the uh, uh, petrol segment earlier, it was but in a very small manner. It was almost negligible presence. But now suddenly there's a strong shift. So uh, going forward, uh, do you think uh, no, uh, petrol will be uh, a major play for you uh, as, as will it be for the passenger vehicle industry? What will be the role of diesel? So um, thank you, Sundra, for asking this question. And uh, all the viewers, uh, I hope it finds you very safe health. Uh, and uh, the time of COVID, uh, uh, whatever we can best, we can support you guys. Uh, we can always uh, do, and you can always uh, uh, approach Mahindra at any point wherever you need support in the COVID crisis. So yeah, extending that support to all the viewers and, and uh, those who are listening to us. And let me get into this uh, question quickly. Um, so Mitra, this uh, shift uh, is twofold because the fuel uh, price disparity that has disappeared. I mean, the gasoline and diesel that you know, uh, 35 rupees, uh, uh, 20, 20, at least 20 rupees difference was there earlier, and now it is nearly no difference, and it is very similar. And then, therefore, it is then coming to affordability and number of kilometers that a person runs uh, versus the return that he gets yeah, for buying a diesel vehicle or a gasoline vehicle. 
typically the diesel vehicle is little costlier than the gasoline vehicle and depending on upon the segment depending upon which segment whether it is a hatchback or sedan or mv um and crossover suv crossover so it varies today if you look at crossover in the in the last quarter that i looked at from january to march in india uh, 57% is petrol uh, whereas in the hatchback it is 98% so obviously this is telling us once the diesel uh, uh, to petrol the uh, price parity is removed and the diesel power trains are brought to ba6 levels um, so therefore this shift is happening uh, because of the the selling price versus what he number of kilometers that a customer drives and for that price that he is buying or the return that he is getting so obviously it is uh, driven by this um diesel today uh, matches to the world standards in emissions and, and therefore there is no concern with respect to emissions uh, of, of course you get a fuel efficiency uh, benefit over gasoline but uh, uh, yeah it, it depends on number of kilometers that you have so we do believe that the heavier vehicles will continue like the passenger vehicles lighter vehicles will move to, to uh, where uh, you go to office and come back you don't drive too much kilometers it it might continue with the uh, gasoline because the The, the initial purchase price is lower um the trucks uh, and the goods mover will continue with the diesel so, so yeah that's a, that's the view that i have but uh, uh mr velu sami from the con- in the context of uh, meeting future norms uh, the role of power trains uh diesel will continue to be a uh, you know very crucial and integral part uh, especially when it comes to let, let's say um uh, meeting the upcoming uh, cafe to norms so uh, how do you see that uh, so it depends on the uh, intent of the government so if the intent of the government is to become an environmental leader for example europe is a, is to uh, europe wants to become an env- environment leader and the focus there is a uh, tank to wheel co2 which is uh, co2 emissions yeah uh, there it's a huge pressure to meet these co2 norms correct and then therefore the uh, you there is a hybridization happening and there is a battery electric vehicle happening and then and therefore when you put a hybrid plus diesel then the passenger car vehicles become unaffordable to a customer at the same time on a gasoline you put a hybrid you are able to sell it so when you hybridize automatically you are bringing the gasoline portion into picture so it is not um that inability of diesels to meet the emissions today all the technologies are available to meet it but it is more expensive than uh, what you can afford with the gasoline and uh, and uh, gasoline hybrids so the plug in hybrid electric vehicles the hybrid electric vehicles and the ice uh, they are now into the race followed by the uh, the battery electric vehicles so right. today if you look at the european industry where they are they are about 5.7% is the battery electric vehicle today sales in europe um and if you take the plug in hybrid electric vehicle they are at 8.2% and a hybrid electric vehicle if you see 48 volt and all this they are about 18.4% so if you look at in a way um this is this is close to um 35% nearly 32% and the ic is uh, nearly coming to 65% correct so already hybridization has taken a big leap because the clear intention for them is to become an environment leader and then therefore bv is costly right now in the range anxiety and infrastructure so the hybrid is fulfilling that gap right now um once you become a hybrid then instead of diesel gasoline takes the front seat and the gasoline right. uh, the diesel takes the back seat that's the reason why uh, the different patterns are behaving the way they are be having different one right but if you uh, look at um, yeah but in in india i think um, the diesel is helping the co2 uh, till the hybrid uh, uh, comes to fulfill and again it depends on the segment if you take the uh, the uh, the suv and crossover segments diesel will play a role and if you have a, a hatchback segment the gasoline hybrids will play a role before the bev comes into picture so diesel is here to stay in certain segments um, and and today there are no true power trains you are going to have battery electric vehicle you are going to have plug in hybrids you are going to have uh, normal hybrid vehicles and then you will have uh, ice vehicles 
So right. you have to live with these five uh, products together, depending on right. the signal you are operating. Very simply put, about the scenario, it's not. It's no longer about petrol or diesel. It's about a, a multiple options in terms of powertrains for various reasons: for consumer preferences, for convenience, for uh, fuel cost, as well as, of course, the very crucial reason of meeting the norms. So, in that context, let me bring in our next speaker, Gaurav Gupta, who represents MG Motor, which offers all of them: petrol, diesel, hybrid and uh, BVs also. But in terms of, let's say, uh, emission, tailpipe emission, BV is the silver bullet, but we all know that it's still some time away. But uh, Gaurav, just to get your uh, perspective on the current uh, uh, market trends for powertrains, uh, because you offer uh, a bouquet of them. So uh, how has been your experience and which, are, which ones do you think uh, no, are, show a lot of prospects as uh, regulations become stringent as well as thank you so much Rob. I think uh, you know, yeah no I, I was saying uh, what are the current market trends that you see and uh, uh, potentially uh, in the future what could be the market trends given the uh, emission norms which are going to get more stringent as well as consumer awareness is on the rise in terms of environment friendliness Thank you. And I think, uh, you know, I agree with what uh, Mr. Veluswamy just, uh, you know, uh, shared in terms of statistics. And I think uh, all the OEMs here today in India, and I'm just going to take one step back in terms of, you know, because you talk about the, the challenges that we face today, you know, and how are we going to be ready for the future? I think one of the biggest uh, hurdles that we all are facing is confirmation of the direction, you know, confirmation of what the statistics are required to be done, you know, whether it is the confirmation factor for an RDE coming in 2023, or whether it is the ethanol in terms of the percentage and the timelines, whether it is the consistency of even the BS6 fuel across the country, which is varied. So I think the starting point has to be that we, we all have to really, you know, uh, request that there has to be a clarity, there has to be a a, a go ahead that this is the number that we are looking for, whether it's in, like I said, you know, from a confirmation factor, et cetera, so that at least the, the organizations, all the OEMs can then work backwards in terms of N minus two, N minus three years, whatever it is, and prepare ourselves according to that. I think that is something we all are, are grappling with. Uh, frankly, the time is, uh, is running out. Uh, you know, because from a 30 month cycle to a RDE, now it is 24 months as we speak, it's getting even shorter uh, and, and we need to really get that direction and then move forward. So to me, that is the number one challenge that we are facing as OEMs. And I think uh, that needs to be called out uh, loud and clear. Uh, the second part uh, is in terms of, uh, of course, the cafe norms are there and we all are working towards, you know, having the portfolio, you know, well, you could say uh, kind of, uh, you, you kind of hedge your portfolio, which supports your requirement. Uh, from that perspective, I think the, the direction of electric vehicles or the direction on hybrids has to be uh, the, way, the way in the future uh, in terms of multiples, but more importantly, even from a country perspective, to reduce the oil pool deficit and bring in the latest technology in the country. Uh, so uh, I believe that uh, you know, the, the momentum on EV has to be increased. There is a lot of talk about EVs. Uh, in terms of uh, higher capacity batteries, in terms of uh, you know more powertrains, in terms of more uh, power electronics localization in India, uh, and I think that has to move forward more aggressively. At least on an NG front, we are working in the area of uh, you know looking at battery assembly uh, moving forward. But the entire uh, challenge that's going to also come with electric vehicles uh, in terms of battery recycling, uh, battery servicing will be important. So I think we have to work in that area as, as an overall industry, along with all the stakeholders. Uh, number three, you talked about you know, the, the, the hybrids also. Uh, still, we don't have you know, the so-called real uh, you know, hybrids. We still have a lot of mild hybrids as we speak. And I think uh, as we get that direction, uh, and it's, it's a two-way story. It's not about just waiting from a, from a policy perspective. It's also an OEM responsibility also to bring in the products. But then again, it goes back to, you know, how does it all play out uh, in the overall uh, emission standards as well? So I think from a portfolio perspective, most of the OEMs today in the country, uh, you know, with the international collaborations are well equipped to bring in technology, which will be serving for the future. Having said so, 
uh, NG for particular, I think we would be, uh, you know, very, uh, we, we are uh, looking at EV as being a big, big direction for the future. We uh, are working on new products in the electric vehicle category. Uh, and I think we're working on the stakeholders as well. So uh, overall, the challenges to summarize my comments would be policy confirmation, timelines, so everybody can work backwards. Second, the direction on electric vehicles and hybrids to get really mass market because that is where the real emissions support will be there for the environment, for the country as well. And third, a unified approach from a stakeholder perspective, from a components in the industry as well to support this entire drive. Very well summarized, uh, Gaurav. And uh, whether, whether it is uh, electric mobility or the conventional uh, ICE vehicles, uh, Stable, sustainable uh, policies, uh, clear policies are absolutely crucial. In fact, uh, that that itself is uh, a topic of our session uh, tomorrow. So indeed, uh, that is extremely crucial for industry players to kind of draw their own plans, uh, mid, mid to long-term plans. And as we all know, auto industry is a very capital intensive industry. So uh, sustainable, and sustainable policies are extremely important. But I just want to get your uh, thought on the current market scenario, Gaurav. I mean, let's say your first vehicle, uh, the Hector, uh, is, it offers all the power, different powertrains. Uh, what is the kind of uh, consumer preference you, you see? And over the uh, ever since it was launched, have you seen any change in preference in terms of the mix of uh, powertrains? We took, the, uh, we took a call because the, traditionally that segment actually is a largely predominantly diesel segment. And, and we brought in uh, a gasoline, a petrol, as well as a hybrid petrol to add on to the power to the entire portfolio. And we are seeing actually a great, a great shift towards petrol and petrol hybrid uh, as we speak. In fact, uh, to, be on, uh, to be sharing within the numbers, it's almost to the tune of almost... Um, you know, 60, 40, and when 60% is actually petrol and 40% for us is the, is the diesel. So it's actually flipping versus what the industry is. And that again goes on to prove that if you are able to provide, you know, a, a good performing gasoline engine, people are looking at that. And given the fact that you have a mild hybrid, that ratio is increasing in our portfolio also. Good to know about that. And that's an interesting uh, uh, data, that you, data point that you shared in, in a segment which was conventionally more of diesel there's a 60 percent of in your sales at least are, are uh, is petrol so uh thanks for that i'll come back to you gaurav uh, now let me bring in mr uh, sanjeev saxena to get a uh, uh, tier one uh, global tier one perspective uh, in terms of uh the powertrain development technology development uh you know uh, localization is absolutely key uh, this, as much as the automotive Indian automotive industry has met the stringent target of uh, meeting the BS6 uh, challenge in about three years or so, uh, however, the average import content in the powertrain has shot up significantly. So, to preempt such problem, uh, what kind of steps uh, do you think uh, you know, the industry should take? And specifically for Schaeffler, how are you preparing for uh, the future, the upcoming norms? I will, uh, since I represent uh, a global company, and uh, I will start from <clears throat> our global direction. So, in every part of geography, uh, uh, starting from Europe to, uh, to North America and Asia, uh, China, uh, as well as India, we have a cl very clear what we call as vision power train, which tells us what is the mix of uh, pure electric, uh, battery electric, the hybrid various kind of hybrids, IC engines combined uh, for the fast car or the light uh, vehicle category. And uh, based upon that, we have uh, put our strategies of localization, bringing in the global technologies, bring, making sure that the which country becomes the best cost country plus the service provider for the whole globe in that uh, scenario, having the capabilities and also having the, the manufacturing footprint of course, that can be transferred from here to there. On that perspective, coming to India, see, <clears throat> when we look at India, we have, uh, if you look at India just from the passenger car point of view, I think that will be a mistake. 
in the sense when we talk about automotive industry here in india it's a very diverse we talk about two wheeler base we talk about a uh, three wheeler which is no bear uh, well, not so much everywhere else we talk about uh, uh, fast cars it fast cars also the shared mobility and then we talk about uh, last mile uh, <clears throat> connectivity is those small vehicles which uh, we see delivering the big uh, big, uh, big basket and uh, amazons and so on so forth and then we talk about the long haulage and the truck and the mcb industry and i think uh, it is extremely important for us to understand what are the unique uh, uh, requirements of each one of those industries uh, segments i would say and to cater to that of course there is a, one can argue that there is a, a diversity within the segment also but i will leave that aside for the moment so when we talk about if we start uh, from the two wheeler perspective one thing is to show that uh, that will that will be one of the first uh, segment to be electrified so on the power train front our strategy in india would be to put more and more investment technology as well as have frugal technology because we are aware of the cost sensitivity of uh, that segment very frugal kind of technology to help that segment on the power train scenario currently we have several uh, 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 electric two wheelers but i think they can be helped with respect to power train and with respect to with respect to the performance so we have uh, what we call as twin track for those segments also there's also caters to the uh, three wheeler segment which has a kind of a, a dual transmission system coming to the past car and that is a very interesting area for india we think uh, by about uh, 2025 we have mapped up to 2035 but let me give you some key numbers to what we think about the uh, 2025 is going to happen the hybridization which is practically zero today i mean i would for point one or something uh, that that's going to move up that's going to move up somewhere around uh, 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 5% by 2025 and little more up to about uh, 30 odd percent uh, till 2030 now very one key th- topic about hybridization is that uh, every hybrid engine uh, every hybrid vehicle will have a ic engine so that means and when we look at the volumes we are sure that the ice engine volume from today is going to double by 2030 there is at by 2025 there is no doubt about that looking at the numbers so now is the balancing act which comes into play that you have to make sure that you are catering to those technologies which are on ice engine next is you are catering to technologies which are hybrid plus ice engines and at the same time preparing for the electrification because electrification we believe will be about 3% by uh, 2025 and uh, reach at least to a level of 10% by 2030 or, or, there, or thereabouts uh, as far as uh, electrification is concerned we take that as a long term and a fixed deposit where we will have to invest we cannot invest in that everywhere in the world so primarily there are investment strategies which are happening of course we are also utilizing india in that context uh, from the what are the capabilities available in india especially on the software and the development capabilities those are the capabilities which are getting the, uh, uh, leverage from india also now <clears throat> so within that scenario when we look at that uh, uh, overall picture we have to make sure that how we taper down our investment elsewhere in the globe because the numbers which you really want to mention are different uh, in the europe so we are bringing in technologies also manufacturing and also making india as a best cost uh, hub for uh, ic related technologies and also gradually towards uh, uh, hybrid technologies so on the power train front primarily when we come to a very different segment of uh, uh, and w- one more thing which i want to mention here is uh, we like it or not uh, our market is dominated about 65 to 70 percent to as of today by two pascar oems which will have their strategy mapped down in asia other parts of asia other than india and that is uh, where the challenge comes in that uh, how we are making sure that we are part of that strategy ensuring that there is a close touch and we are actually <clears throat> in in uh, 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 completely in understanding on the manuf- uh, manufacturing footprint and also on the makers layout one and of course there are then uh, the local manufacturers uh, uh, which we mentioned which are which are which are 
doing a wonderful job towards that journey. And that is where we are engaged with each one of them to showcase what we can bring to the table, bring, uh, depending upon their uh, requirement. For example, for heavy vehicles, we have certain technologies which can help overall innovation, it's purely powertrain uh, technologies related to engines, also towards NVH, make sure to make sure they are that they are able, depending upon their weights, depending on the engine sizes, they are able to utilize those. So that's how uh, we are playing. Coming to the HCV, HCV segment, I think that's going to be a very different ball game because uh, also in the smaller commercial vehicles, because there you'll have to see what is for last mile connectivity, which is what is for shorter distance and what is for longer distance, and the power to scenario will have to be different according to that. So, in uh, if I if I can conclude these points, there is no one size fits all. There will have to be multitude of solutions we will have to bring in. We will have to keep ready depending on the customer preference. We will have to give it uh, give to them. Also, one thing that we firmly believe in is that uh, when we talk about uh, government being clear, well, the government will be clear, the direction, legislation will be clear when they will be. I think it is also industry's duty to bring in those uh, solutions, keep them ready and help those. Uh, so coming back to like when we talk about electrification, my mind always goes back to 2017, the ECMA conference, when Mr. Gadkari came and said, talked about things which actually shocked the whole industry. But when we met the next year, I think we were pretty much okay. We were pretty much alive. So I think that is the kind of attitude which the industry will have to exhibit and ensure that we are moving along those paths and making sure that we are becoming future ready. So that will be my uh, input to those. Things. Thank you. Uh, there, there cannot be a one size fits all uh, solution, but uh, as you uh, currently develop your solutions at Shefra Globally, or even Shefra India, I believe, the India R&D team plays a key global role as well. Uh, how uh, how are you tapping the critical engineering strength of Indian engineers uh, towards developing solutions for uh, even powertrains to meet future norms, uh, maybe elsewhere, but definitely in India? That's a, that, that's a very good question. And uh, for example, for two-wheeler, we are very clear that India is going to be the global hub. We are not going to do two-wheeler uh, development, powertrain, etc. anywhere else. It is India where it is going to happen. So we are very clear about that. Coming to the next stage when we talk about the, the uh, uh, MSCV tractor transmission kind of products, there we also we are very clear that India is more or less the hub and that is where we are, we are going to do all the development. Now coming to the large area of Pascal where we have again have to have multitude of, uh, of uh, uh, strategies. There we know the capabilities in India is towards uh, uh, designing in the sense that uh, having technical centers, a very good capability towards uh, softwares. So we are leveraging that at a very big, uh, in, in a very big way. We are actually talking about our, uh, we already have a center which is established in India. We're talking about uh, 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 <clears throat> actually taking up to, it up to about 100 people by end of the year and further in the coming days. So those are the things which will come, uh, which uh, will gradually be released. But uh, we are very clear that what are the technologies, what are the capabilities uh, uh, available in India, we are leveraging that, uh, that. Also, there are certain confidential projects which we are working on to ensure how we leverage the, the Indian supplier base to help our global initiatives, just to make sure that we are ready when it comes to India. So that's our strategy to run that part uh, on localization. Of course, normal localization continues. We are at about uh, uh, 70 odd person. So that will continue. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing those uh, that information. Uh, now, let me come to uh, our next speaker, Jean-Paul Roux uh, from uh, the Soul System. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, he joins us from uh, Paris. And uh, he, is, he is not uh, uh, new to India. He is uh, in his earliest stint uh, in his previous organization. He was in charge of setting up uh, the business in India. So he's quite familiar with the Indian car industry. So uh, Jean-Paul, uh, just, I mean, you are, uh, I mean, the salt system is a supplier, but of a different kind. If I may use the word enabler, maybe. Uh, so as uh, you know, the emission norms get more and more stringent, uh, designing, for example, becomes even more crucial. So what kind of, uh, no, what are the focus areas that uh, 
uh, uh, the salt system is uh, is uh, not focusing on to ensure that uh, you en enable your clients to meet the stringent, uh, increasingly stringent emission norms at a very uh, competitive cost. And of course, the timeline. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sumantra. Uh, first of all, let me introduce a bit uh, the, the, the talk here. Um, as you say, I am, I am in Paris sitting here, but uh, I have a lot of friends and connection in India. Then my thoughts are going to you guys right now because we know the pandemic in India is very severe. And I hope that you are all, uh, all safe. Okay. And I hope as well that uh, when travel will get back, uh, we'll be able to meet. I know some of the, the, the gentlemen here in the panel. Uh, because I've been working directly with their organization, like the one of Mindra and Mr. Velusami, uh, that uh, we had a very good experiences uh, in, in the previous years on developing cars and uh, to meet, you know, um, uh, fuel emission, low drag, and, and so on. Then um, just maybe as an introduction, because, you know, we are talking about reducing uh, emission here, and you are not going to hear from me and the system uh, we are not experts, you know, in, you know, the domain of uh, hybridization, uh, developing engine and so on. We are providing technology that will help uh, our clients, okay? But just a few words because sustainability, that's what we are talking about here of the economy and the society means, means a lot for us. And you know that uh, today the, the, the DNA and the goal of Dassault system is to provide digital twin, virtual twin, okay, to our clients in order that they can uh, imagine, engineer, and develop new products, new subsystem to offer to our citizens better life, okay, and better products uh, in, in the world. Then we are really uh, after this goal. Um, and also, you know, recently uh, our CEO, Bernard Charles, made the commitment that by 2025, the Dassault system will reach certain goals that are directly linked to sustainability, okay? We want to reduce by 40% compared to 2018, the consumption of uh, CO2, okay? Or the production of CO2 by FTE, okay? Full-time equivalent person in the Dassault system. And recently as well, we have joined a, a, a European uh, organization that is called European Green Digital Coalition because it has been proven that using digital twin, you can reduce from now until 2030, the equivalent of 7.5 gigaton of CO2. And the 7.5 gigaton of CO2, that's the equivalence of what the industry or the transportation industry is producing every year as CO2, okay? Then we are definitely, you know, part of this uh, uh, big challenge of, of reducing CO2 and uh, helping our clients. And now to, to come more to, to your questions, um, we are, we see us as a facilitator, okay? As I told you yesterday, we are an enabler and we provide software technology in order that our clients can build their digital twin. And I would say there are two areas really where we can impact and, and contribute here. Um, you know, I'm belonging to the Simulia organization, which means that that's where we have all the 1D, 3D simulation tool. And with that, you know, you, you can improve, you can participate to the, the reduction of the emission in very various domain, okay? You, we can help, for example, our clients to design uh, better engines, okay? Either gasoline or diesel engine, as we have been discussing, because they are still going to be there for, for a while. But in the meantime, you know, uh, we can also, then when we can um, help them to design engine, for example, we can uh, use the light weighting, light, light weighting uh, technology, optimize the shape, um, and, you know, usually in average, uh, today, when our clients are using those technology, they can bring the, the, the weight down from, the, from a, a part or a sub-assembly from 10, 15, 20, 25%, okay, roughly. Then we, we, can, uh, we can definitely help on that. There are other topics uh, as well, like uh, aerodynamics. You know, we can really help uh, to design a much better car. Um, we started this long, uh, long haul of reducing uh, drag with cars uh, when we did the, the, the Qashqai project in the system uh, for Nissan. It was starting in 2004. And at that time, uh, Nissan released a car that was the best in class SUV on the market in 2007. But uh, more recently, uh, maybe Mr. Velusami, uh, we remember that uh, we work with this team either in, uh, in North America with Mr. Rick Haas and also Dr. Sharma in MRV to bring 
uh, the, 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 the drag of the Marazzo car uh, to the target and the requirement that they were setting. Then, you know, from simulation point of view, we continue to develop, to innovate on our simulation technology and simulation tools in order that our clients can better design, you know, the, 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 the vehicle, doing more simulation, more accurate simulation, um, and, and, uh, and optimize the performance of uh, their vehicle or their subsystem up to their requirements and link to their requirements. That's the first angle. But I think the second angle is more uh, linked to the real challenge that the, the, the car industry is facing. And, you know, I have a lot of sympathy here for uh, our friends around the table, because I think that uh, this, in this CO2 quest, there is a huge pressure that is put on the automotive industry. Um, and we know that we could save CO2 in looking, for example, at agriculture, at uh, the steel industry that is uh, producing a lot, okay? But nevertheless, our politicians, they wanted to focus really on the transportation and the automotive industry. And we have seen this industry in, in a kind of a, you know, it's not a, a steady evolution, okay? Since now 10, 15 years, we see a complete revolution. They need to invent and to develop disruptive technology. And I think when, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the car makers or the tier one supplier, they have to invent those new technology. It's very, very challenging, okay? Because they need to innovate. They are pushed to innovate, um, but they don't have 10 years to develop, a, you know, a, a battery, uh, an hybridation system or, uh, you know, th those, those new equipment. They have to come on time on the market, on cost, on quality, maybe with an even shrinked uh, time frame. Okay. And this is putting huge pressure because in addition, you know, we are not, as I said, in a steady evolution, but it's a disruptive, okay, approach that they need to take. Meaning that the engineers, they cannot uh, rely on what was done in the past. They need to invent new way of doing things. Okay. And for that, they have lost their referential. Okay. Then that's why um, also, if you look at, if I take an example, on, we have talked a lot here about uh, EV, electrical vehicle. And, you know, most of those uh, companies are startup, okay, in the world. Uh, and today you would maybe be interested to know that uh, 90, 95% of the EV startup, they have adopted our 3D experience platform technology, which is uh, a collaborative environment where you will bring different stakeholders working on the project, either from design, either from analysts, either from simulation experts, or also testing people to prepare, you know, the, the validation campaign, the testing campaign, whether virtual or physical, in order to prepare the certification of the vehicles. And I think, you know, right now, what we observe in the market is that simulation can yield a lot of benefits, okay, to our clients to optimize their product. But we still believe that, you know, um, to the opposite as a CAD, PLM, PDM, where the revolution has already happened, on simulation, the, simula the, the revolution has not happened. Why? Because the simulation is still very much in the hands of the experts, and there is no yet a big democratization, okay? And I will use a term that uh, is uh, currently uh, used quite a lot, that's the, the front-loading engineering, the left shifting of using simulation at the very beginning of a project with the designers, going into the design studio, okay? And after with the guy who are in charge of analyzing and doing all the what if scenario and bring simulation on a daily, on a routine usage in those phases. And today this is not uh, really happening, okay? Uh, because, you know, people are in a siloed organization and it's very difficult to bring all the stakeholders together, okay? To work in a very short time frame and, uh, and, and come with new concept. It's also the problem of doing uh, trade-offs, okay? Because today, uh, the, the challenges that are facing uh, our uh, uh, car OEMs or uh, tier one supplier here are immense, and you need to do uh, trade-offs on multi requirements, okay? Then for that, you need to have a, a platform, an environment where everyone, every stakeholders will work on the single source of data, what we call single source of truth, and be able to, to, to progress, okay, to, to identify the best scenarios, to engineer the best scenarios, um, okay. and work all together. Right. Right? And that's what we provide to, to the industry. 
and and as you just uh, some mentioned about uh, the startup uh, the strengths or the uh, organizational advantages of a startup as co opposed to a very uh, well established organizations where uh, there could be silos i mean you you have lot many uh, global oems when it comes to uh, meeting uh, the uh, main key goal of stringent norms there may be different routes uh, to achieve that uh, and yes. so uh, uh, towards that uh, what has been your observation in terms of let's say uh, global majors uh, some of them in your home country uh, headquartered in your home country what are the what are the key focus areas that they are targeting to achieve the uh, end goal yeah i think you know right, right now uh, light weighting is, uh, is is definitely a, a big uh, a big thing that uh, all uh, our clients are, are, are after uh, the efficiency of the vehicle itself okay the, the aerodynamic resistance the rolling resistance are you know areas where a lot of uh, a lot of uh, work is being done um, and also the, the 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 overall engine engine efficiency as well has been uh, one of the key one of the key topic here thank you thank you jean paul uh, you know uh, mr velasami uh, since uh, we uh, india is progressing towards the next stage of cafe norms you know as i understand correct me if i'm wrong uh, the cafe norms attracts very stringent uh, co2 reduction which means uh, you have to have good uh, air control uh, consistent uh, fuel control as well as thermal management of course and along with that light weighting as uh, mr jean paul mentioned and also finally leading to what they is uh, what is quite commonly referred to as a platinum metal group so in, the, in in such a scenario uh, how are oems and uh, suppliers trying to address this issue uh, is is there a, uh, are you kind of drawing up any holistic approach uh, or collaborative approach to meet these challenges uh yes so um my panel colleagues uh, shared wonderful uh, thoughts. Uh, I would like to share some thoughts on the power train before we go to this, uh, is that okay? Uh, Absolutely, please. Uh, there are a lot of uh, thoughts about hybrid, uh, plug-in hybrid and diesel, gasoline, ice, whether it will survive or not. So let's let's uh, a few, uh, spend a few minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Yeah, okay. Let's, uh, let's spend a few minutes on uh, the three big markets that we have. The Europe, you have about uh, 20 million, um, right now maybe 15, 16, but established, let's say 20 million units. China is about 25 million and reaching to 30, 30 million. Yeah? And then we are talking about North America, 16 million. Right now, the IHS forecast uh, is that in China, by 2030, you will have only 13% um, BEV. That's a forecast. So the remaining 59% is ice. And BHEV, which is based out of ice, is 6%. And hybrid electric vehicle, again, based out of ice, is again 21%. Okay. So if you take this 21% plus 59% plus 6%, that adds up to the total, except the 13% for BEV. Now, in China, if you look at it, the ice alone is 22% predictive hybrid electric vehicle uh, hybrid electric vehicle means with ice is about 44 percent and plug-in is about eight percent and the battery electric vehicle predicted is 25 percent that i'm talking 23rd so the range in the europe is very similar numbers of china so i'm not reading it out so if the range that you see the bev we are talking about 24 uh, percent in europe and china in north america about 13 percent that's the range that we are talking about. So at the at the most, what ha what happens is the 25% of BB and 75% of ice needs to be served. And the 75% of the ice is split between pure ice and the hybrid. In the hybrid, it can be plug-in hybrid and the uh, standard hybrids. This is the fundamental story. Now, is there anybody who can tell us what can happen to these ratios, whether the battery electric vehicle can move forward better than these numbers. So let's look at the challenges, uh, two, three challenges that we need to address on the uh, battery electric vehicle. So I leave that point and then I'll go to this point. So that the, the lot of questions coming, I was watching these questions. 
the battery cost has to come down from 140 150 euro to 115 euro if the battery electric vehicle have to become a mass market vehicle that's for sure not only battery cost but the power electronics cost also has to come down by 30% correct uh, maybe 3.6 uh, dollars to 2.5 dollars something like that, whatever whatever number is so that's the range that we are talking about per kilowatt i'm talking about here the power electronics cost and the battery cost until it comes down you cannot make the bev uh, the mass market today the bev is telling for four reasons you have a co2 legislation so that you have to have a mix of bev and hybrid electric vehicles you have an euro 7 legislation so the cost of the diesels and the cost of the gasins are going up because of the rpe the big benefit that the bevs have got is incentives yeah and then the fear of ban of ic vehicles okay these are the fears these are the levers that are pushing so as the bev takes certain percentage today you are at 5.7% as the bev takes certain percentage in the market governments will not continue to give in incentives because if you are talking about economy if you are talking about uh, import bill you will not substitute that import bill saving into your incentives right incentives and in, in, import bill in a way is the common for government because you lose money okay right? now let's look at the other uh, fact of this uh, electric vehicle so, some uh, facts have to be put on the table and then uh, people will decide today you have 450 gigawatt hour the battery cell capacity available and which is 345 is available right now in the asia pacific mainly in china and, and, and then other asian countries and then europe has got about 60 and us has got about 45 giga uh, watt hour the battery cell production capacity and so then you know that these three markets have got a very similar number of uh, the transportation vehicles but the battery production capacity is skewed towards china right now yes you think, correct you have to rebalance this and we are right now about battery vehicle about 5.7 percent let's say six percent if you have to go to 25 percent yeah you have to five to six times you have to increase the scale correct the battery production capacity has to be because i'm assuming today you are putting x number of battery cells and if five percent is there the five percent has to go to 25 percent or 30 percent i i have to six times i have to increase it so if i produce if i project 30 percent now the 450 gigawatt hour has to go to 3000 gigawatt hour and that has to go to unifamily europe us and this so there are plans put up but these plans have to materialize you have to get the battery capacity production correct so these are the three four five ifs and buts on the battery electric vehicle and therefore the headwinds are many and then i'm not talking about the infrastructure issues uh, charging infrastructure and, and and so it's not easy to bring a battery electric vehicle 50 percent 70 percent and 100 percent it's not easy it is going to take lot lot amount of work to do in this area then only we can make it realistic so that's the point number uh, the last point that on the eyes and then i'll come back to your question what did we say environmentally nox is the problem okay we said we have 50 micrograms per cubic meter of air and about 20 is contributed by city activities city inner activities and 30 micrograms per cubic meter is contributed by the transportation okay now we brought euro 6 or the bs6 euro 6d bs6 all this with that it has come to about 22.8 20 is contributed by the city and 2.8 is contributed by uh, the transportation now whatever you do euro 7 euro 8 euro 9 euro 10 you can keep discussing you are discussing 10 percent of that 22 correct please bear in mind the economy you have to watch out for the economy the infrastructure please bear in mind that you have to create the battery capacity you have to create infrastructure you have to create all this so the hard facts have to go through i understand the emotional aspect around this 
but there is an there is an emotional uh, aspect about the business also right so i think whoever takes the decision they have to put all these facts on the table together and then look the prism without refractions and deflections look at the right number and then you'll get an answer what is realistically feasible and set the norms accordingly because it takes 2 to 3 years and 4 years for us to develop anything right and then therefore the pace at which i i remember in 2016 people are saying by 2020 we will have 25% pev 15% pev 30% pev where are we we are at 5.7% today with significant incentives correct so therefore the predictions are one thing and the insight about predictions and the understanding the headwinds is the other thing that that uh, one need to be very very careful about it and that's the thought i think it is reflecting from all of our uh, panel members that we should gear up for multiple power train options because we have at the end of the day meet legislations but what percentage of which power train depends on what segment you are operating and uh, one segment needs uh, one treatment another segment needs another treatment that we have seen in even in india sedan or hatchback needs 98% whereas the suvs need 50% gasoline and 40% diesel and 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 then their hybrids and the pv so it, it depends on where where you operate so there is no one size to fit all uh, our front jp said the, uh, and i, I think uh, gaurav uh, gupta sanjay uh, sanjeev said there's no one size to fit each oem is allowed to uh, select what what is the affordable model uh, okay in this process probably i uh, i missed the accuracy of your question can you repeat no, no absolutely fine i i can repeat any i was talking about the cafe norms and as they progress as you go to the uh, next stage you know i mean as i understand uh, co2 reduction is very stringent under these norms and uh, which means you need to have you know good uh, uh, air control consistent uh, fuel uh, fuel control as well as well as friction re reduction and thermal management and also uh, what is commonly referred to in the industry as the platinum metal group all these needs to be in place uh, to meet uh, so in such a scenario um, how are you preparing is there any kind of uh, a holistic or collaborative uh, you know uh, approach uh, along with your let's say tier ones uh, how basically i want to understand how is the industry preparing for it uh, both uh, oems and so yeah, that's a brilliant question sumanth uh, the first and foremost on the co2 is the the weight of the vehicle so as the weight goes up you put a bigger engine you put a bigger brakes you put a bare, bigger steering system then you put a bigger cooling system you put a bigger exhaust system maybe jp is happy but <laughs> it also other way around so everything becomes bigger the kernel of the problem is the core biw the chassis weight yeah the seat basically the customer is sitting on the seven seats or five seats that's it correct and that's the starting point what is the weight of that seats and then the floor now there is a emission requirement that wants a lower weight there is a fuel efficiency requirement that wants a lower weight clearly correct there is a requirement of safety crash safety nvh refinement uh, three star four star five star g and cap ratings and the suv look the stands and the styles and then panoramic sunroof all these stuffs they are pushing your weight up so there is one side customer requirements another side legislative requirements and third side is engineering trade offs that is possible now the only way that you can resolve this problem is getting all the component suppliers together for example the the windshield that you are using whether you are using 3.2 mm or 2.5 mm and whether you are using green glass well, which nobody would think wind glass is uh, windshield is making a difference to the co2 correct but if you use 2.5 or 2.8 you are making difference and this story does not end with windshield it it, it starts with uh, even the uh, the floor mat people so you have to get everybody together and tell them what he can contribute to co2 and weight reduction so weight reduction and co2 reduction that's the only way to address this problem and there is no other way the core is how well you are structurally your biw is designed and if your biw is about out of 1500 kilos your biw weight is 350 kilos and then you rest everything you put is to carry the biw in the road 
if your bw is 300 kilos accordingly all your system weight will come down 250 kilos accordingly all your system will uh, weight will come down still you can carry the same passenger so that's why people go for new platforms and and it is so important that uh, i mean jp talked about aerodynamics rolling resistance and aerodynamics resistance all this come into play but the fundamental thing is to get the weight down at the bearer therefore the bw design and uh, its weight will be extremely crucial and that is the uh, bw comes down brake system comes down engine power comes down all small small engines um uh, gauro can tell and he has a he has a vehicle and he can put the still still put a 1.5 liter engine and run correct it, it, it it's it's about all about weight people will think such a car you need a 2 liter but uh, but more than sufficient right fine it, 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 it's 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 about that and and uh, and a good example that you cited i mean the hector given its dimensions uh, one would assume that it's a very heavy vehicle and uh, may need a very powerful you no know, powerful powertrain and but it does a good job with its current size of powertrain uh, thank you very much never understanding it's not a heavy vehicle so just just yeah. to put the yes yes so uh, 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 gorup i was coming to you uh, no i mean uh, since uh, you had touched upon uh, bvs and also hybrids which is in your case mild hybrids as of now is uh, i mean mg has more than made its uh, intent clear with in, in terms of its focus on bevs but how about hybrid uh, going ahead do you, do you expect uh, hybrid hybrids to get more affordable is there any uh, uh, are there any efforts at mg uh, or at the headquarters to kind of uh, make hybrids also a significant uh, share of your overall uh, portfolio along with bevs and the conventional partners you know i want to first uh, really thank uh, mr velu swami for a very good uh, you know uh, foundation setting uh, because this is this exactly reminds us of our uh, you know uh, uh, discussion within the company as well in terms of what the direction will be so i think for the audience the sector is a very good learning ground as well second to your point about electric vehicles as well as uh, the direction on hybrid i think uh, our bet right now for for india right now continuing is on the electric vehicles uh that is the way we are going to go forward but at the same time sumantra we are also exploring very actively alternative options like you talked about hybrid so the entire portfolio of uh, you know electric vehicles and new solution is being is being studied as we speak both uh, within the country as well as our uh, global headquarters as well because multiple options are there uh, and obviously you know it also is a function of uh, like comes um, well as we said in terms of uh, you know your chassis and what works better As, as an overall combination so both hybrids are also worked upon as well as electric vehicles in terms of immediate to the market we believe that the that the work that's been done right now uh, electric vehicles uh, you know is is where we are uh, pushing more and more uh, energy and focus upon uh, we believe that technology is is evolving very rapidly you know moving from liquid electrolytes to solid state batteries which will be able to compare you know compact and get more denser batteries giving us more mileage and that should be able to give a uh, you know even a, a break point of 10 lakh rupees in india in terms of uh, electric vehicle which will give you a uh, uh, sufficient mileage can be the, the the tipping point overall so to summarize uh, both are being worked on parallelly uh, but at the same time uh, ev i think is where we would be uh, more more optimistic right now 